the book of Jeremiah chapter 6. The message tonight is entitled The Old Paths. It's a familiar topic from the book of Jeremiah. I do not want that to detour your mind or distract you as to what we are dealing with. But we do live in a day where we have come to a place where there's a new type of Christianity that says they don't want the old paths. Now, I understand what they are referring to and what they are talking about, but it is completely different in their mind than what we're dealing with here in Jeremiah chapter number 6. Because when you get to Jeremiah chapter 6, you're going to understand some main things about what the prophet is saying and what he wants you to get back to concerning the old paths. We're not looking for some new way. Amen. Amen. Jesus is the only way. And we understand tonight as we come to him that we need to get back to him. Look at what it says in the book of Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse number 11. The word of the Lord says, Therefore I am full of the fury of the Lord. Notice this statement. I am weary with holding in. The picture that I get with that is when I was a young child and I did some things that I should not have done. And you would look at my dad's face or his demeanor and you would see that he was a daddy that was weary with holding in. He didn't want to hold it in anymore. He wanted to unleash his judgment for lack of better words. And I think of that with God here in this passage. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out, the judgment, upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the aged with him that is full of days. And their houses shall be turned unto others with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. They have healed also the herd to the daughter of my people, slightly saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old pass, where is the good way, and walk therein. And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Let's pray and let's ask God to help us in this topic of the old paths. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, as we bow before you, we are very thankful for your word that we get to hold in our hands tonight. We understand that there was a generation that could not say so. And we understand that tonight there are tribal groups and nations that still do not have the written word of God in their possession. And for that we are burdened and for that we realize that sometimes your Bible becomes routine for us and even mundane. Very often we become ungrateful for these precious pages white as snow. I pray that tonight you would help us to get back to these old paths. That we would understand the need to be in the word and all about the word. And I pray that you would help us that we may honor you with our life and with our calling. I pray that you would receive the glory now through this message in Jesus' name. And all God's people prayed and said, Number one tonight, I want you to see the neglect. The neglect. Have you ever neglected something? Look at what the people of God neglected. They neglected simply the fear of God. Look at what it says in verse number 11. Therefore, God is full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad, upon the assembly of the young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the aged of him that is full of days. Their houses shall be turned to others with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. And as the prophet delivers this message, and as a prophet begins to feel the same fury of the Lord that the Lord is feeling, we understand that the prophet is delivering this to a people who are without a proper fear of God. You say, preacher, what is a proper fear of God? Is it like a child who runs to your bedroom because he's scared of the boogeyman underneath his bed or in the closet? 
No. The proper fear of God is reverencing God's holiness and respecting Him for who He is, loving what He loves, and hating what He hates. And we see here that the people of God did not have a proper fear of the Lord. They neglected that. And therefore they put themselves into a position of captivity, of bondage, of being put to the chain or being removed from their houses and lands unwillfully because of a decision to not honor God. Listen, my friend, this is so much bigger than not paying your taxes. This is not honoring the God of eternity. This is not fearing who He is. And may tonight we understand that we do not need, it will not be healthy for us to neglect the fear of God. We need to be mindful who our God is. Now underneath neglect, I want you to also understand that they neglected personal holiness. Look at what it says in verse number 13. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is giving to co- given to covetousness. From the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. Can I tell you a story tonight that one of our guest preachers this past week did not share with you? But as I got to sit across from them, they told us a story of covetousness. This is a story of a pastor and a church people from Mississippi. Now in this particular town of Mississippi there was a good gospel preacher preaching at one of the lighthouses there much like this one in Mississippi. The problem was there was an annual missions trip that a few families took every year to Gulf Shores, Alabama. Now without reading between the lines let me just say it wasn't a missions trip at all. Well while this family was doing their thing in Gulf Shores, Alabama the pastor would walk to the mailbox and he would find an envelope that said a bank statement from a bank that he didn't know the church had. And he opened it up and found out that there were thousands of dollars in a bank account under the church's name that according to him he had no idea about. So that next Sunday night they got together and the pastor stood before the people and the pastor said, listen folks, this spontaneous business meeting is for one purpose. I have found out recently that we have a bank account that I did not know we have. It's under the church's name and it has thousands of dollars in it. A lady in the church popped up immediately and with a harsh tone on her voice, she began to cuss the preacher out in front of the entire congregation. She stomped her feet right out those double doors and a couple other families went with her. She proceeded to go to her house or wherever they were gathering that night and she proceeded to rip on the pastor and cuss the pastor up down and one downside and the other and while she was doing so, the pastor caught word a little while later that as she was tearing his name apart, she fell over dead. We found out in that situation that what they had been doing was when a people didn't like their pastor at that church, they would begin siphoning funds into a different account so that they would make it look like the church wasn't doing very good at all. They were coveting their authority over the man of God's authority and they were making it to where that pastor could not survive anymore and would choose to go somewhere else and literally when that lady should have had the fear of the Lord and that family should have had the fear of the Lord they found out that when they did not there were serious repercussions for going against God's man and going against God's way. The Bible still says touch not the Lord's anointed and we even have to be careful about the anointed of God that aren't even doing right because David is a good example of a man of God that said, I won't touch the Lord's anointed. King Saul, even though he tried to spear me, even though he's hunting me across the countryside, even though he wants my life, I respect him. I will not touch him. And even when David had a chance to take King Saul's life, he did not. Why? Because David did not neglect the proper fear of God. David tried to keep it straight. 
So we see here in chapter, in the book of Jeremiah chapter 6, we see the personal holiness of the people had been neglected. They did not have the fear of the Lord. There's covetousness from the prophet even unto the priest. Everyone dealeth falsely. A wicked people. Then in verse number 14, They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. In this area of personal holiness, they were neglecting personal holiness because they were liars. They would look at a situation and they would say, Oh brother, oh sister, it's okay. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. And though they made a person feel okay for a while, they were lying to that person and eventually that person would understand they had been lied to, there really is no peace, and the harm would come to them. Listen, there's some times in your life that you need to be brutally honest. You cannot lie to to cover up the truth. You must not compromise with a lie. You need to shoot it straight. But you need to do it in the right way. You need to do it in truth. In love. You need to bring the word of God. Do not bring lies. Do not try to cover things up. For if you cover up your sin. Or somebody else's. It will only grow like that of Achan. When he took the goodly Babylonian garment. He took their silver and their gold. And he hid him in the ground underneath his tent. And by the way, if you have to hide it, it's probably wrong. If you can't reveal it before others, but you have to conceal it, it's probably wrong. If you have to live in a covert manner, it's probably wrong. These people are saying, peace, peace, oh, everything's okay. Does it remind you of a country that we might possibly live in that says everything's okay, we're healing it? Does it remind you of authority in our country that says there's nothing wrong and they heal things slightly by saying peace, peace, when there really is no peace and from within, destruction is raging and from within, we're being torn apart and from within, the destruction is coming, my friends, the destruction wasn't going to come to Israel because of those without though God was going to use somebody from without the destruction began within the people of God's own life because they were not honest with themselves and they were not honest with other people look at what it says in verse number 15 were they ashamed when they had committed abomination nay they were not at all ashamed neither could they blush Now when you think of those words, abominations, a lot of times you think of the sin of homosexuality. You think of something that is great. You think of something that is enormous in the eyes of man. But can I remind you that not all abominations are as big as you think they are. Take your Bible and go to the book of Proverbs if you would please. Proverbs chapter number 11. This is where we left off. In our study through the book of Proverbs and by the the will of God we'll hopefully be able to get back to the study in the book of the Proverbs. But as you look at Proverbs chapter number 11, the Bible says in verse number 1, a false balance is an abomination. You say, wait a second preacher. We're not dealing with homosexuality here. You're exactly right. We're dealing with a false balance. We're dealing with lying. We're dealing with deceit. We're dealing with trying to get your way over the right way. And a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. Now go to Proverbs chapter number 6. We came through these passages and I'm so thankful that when I was a kid and when I got in trouble real bad one time, my mama made me sit down and write these verses over and over again until I had memorized them. Because it says in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse number 16, these six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look. A lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood. And a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies. And he that soweth discord among the brethren. The problem is we do not look at these things we've just mentioned like we look at the sin of.
of homosexuality. When we look at homosexuality, man, it disgusts us. It doesn't make sense, especially when you're involved in things of the Bible and Christianity. It abhors you. It's not right. It is wrong. It's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. God did not create people to reproduce man and man, woman and woman, but rather man and woman. That doesn't make sense to us who are Bible believers. But I tell you what, it should be just as much an abhorrence to us to have a proud look. It should be just as abhorring to us to have a lying tongue. It should be just as abhorring to us to have hands that shed the innocent blood. It should be just as abhorring to us to have a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Sitting back, not acting out, but thinking it out in our hearts and our minds. It should be just as much a problem to us to have feet that are quick to run behind the scenes to be involved in mischief. It should be just as wrong for us to be a false witness that speaketh lies and it should be just as wrong to us to sow discord among the brethren these six things doth the Lord hate yea seven are an abomination unto him most people believe that the main reason why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah was because of their sodomy but the answer is that is not entirely true If you read your Bible in the book of Ezekiel, you'll find out that God not only destroyed that city because of their homosexuality, God destroyed the city because they would not strengthen the hands of the poor and needy. They would not feed those who were hungry. They lived in an uncompassionate, ill-advised way, and they did not fear the Lord properly, nor did they obtain a personal holiness. Back to the book of Jeremiah chapter 6. We read that verse again, verse number 15. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. And I tell you, my dear friend, you ought to be ashamed at sin. That word ashamed there has the idea of to wither away or to dry up. And my friend, when you come to the realization of your sin... That sin should wither away. That sin should dry up. That sin you should be ashamed at. You should not allow it to happen anymore. And you know what sin God is speaking to your heart about tonight. He's knocking at your heart's door. He's saying, will you let me in? Will you repent? Will you give your life back over to me? What's your answer going to be? It says at the end of verse number 15, Therefore, because they, did not, uh, because they neglected personal holiness, they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. It wasn't a maybe. It wasn't a might. It was a reality that was going to happen as they would neglect personal holiness by neglecting the fear of God. Then I want you to see this. They neglected the word of the Lord. Look back with me to verse number 9. Verse number 9, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They, the captives, bringing those into captivity, those coming in to take them captive, shall throughly glean the remnant of Israel as a vine. Turn back thine hand as a great gatherer into the baskets. And he's literally saying that God is going to be like that great gatherer that goes to those grapes and pulls those grapes from off the vine and removes them from where they're supposed to be. Here's verse 10. Here's the neglect of the word of the Lord. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. The word reproach means a shame. They have no delight in it. They neglected the word of the Lord. They were ashamed of the word of the Lord. Instead of their sin withering away and their sin drying up, the word of God and the desire for it is now drying up and withering away. The word of God is doing what the sin should have been doing in their lives. They did not delight in the word of the Lord. Can I ask you a question? Are you neglecting the fear of the Lord tonight? Are you neglecting personal holiness in your life? Are you neglecting the word of the Lord? Do you delight in it? Oh, how we need to. 
Oh, how we need to. I want to show you a second thought tonight. Not only the neglect, but the need. The need. Look at verse 16. Thus saith the Lord. Here's a popular verse. Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Do you see what the need is in verse number 16? The need simply, first of all, if we were to divide this verse up, is for someone to stand. Now, I have to ask you a question. What are we standing with? What are we standing on in verse number 16? If you look at this chapter and divide it out, well, you know it's saying the old past, but what are we referring to? Or are we referring to old-timey religion? Or are we referring to the Word of God? Because if you read this passage, we're not talking about old-timey religion. We're not talking about the way it used to be hundreds of years ago because I've got something to tell you for the old-style independent Baptist of which I consider myself to be. But the majority of those, they think it's got to be a certain way. But if they went 500 years ago back, they would find out that the songs that they're singing in their churches are contemporary to the ones that were being sung 500 years ago. We understand this, the old-timey religion. No, it is the Word of God. That is where we get back to. That is where we stand. That is what we are to see. He says, thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways. What ways? The way of the Word of God. And see. We need some people who stand in the Word of God, who see the Word of God, who ask for the Word of God, and where is the good way, and then walk in the way of the Word of God. God. It's very simple. See, this passage, by the way, for those who may be involved in it, we need to be new, and we need to be new Baptist, and we need to be new this, and new that. My friends, understand what this chapter is dealing with should not cause you to say, I don't want the old past. It should cause you to say, I need the old past. Because here's what it's saying. The old past are the word of God. The new paths these people were taking were the way of covetousness, the lack of the fear of God, the way of lying, cheating, stealing, wickedness, the way of not being ashamed or blushing when they should have been blushing. I want to get back. That's why the prophet said, you ought to get back to the old ways, the ways of the word of God. You ought to get back to these pages. You ought to get back to my word and walk in it. Now go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, back to the Psalms. Psalm 119, wonderful passage of your Bible. Psalm 119, you ought to read it. If you're so inclined, you ought to memorize it. Psalm 119, look at what it says in verse number 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who, what church? Walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed. Do you see it? The word of God will keep you from being ashamed. The word of God will keep you from blushing when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned that thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. Wherewithal Shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed thereto according to his word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Do you see the idea of walking is not only walking in the commandments and the law and the word of God. But you can also walk or wander out of the commandments of God. But when you do that. You're neglecting a proper fear of God. You're neglecting a personal holiness. And you are neglecting the word of the Lord. Now we don't have time to go through all of Psalm 119. But every single verse aside from 7 I believe. Deals with the word of God. And some variation of the term. And it is important to get back to the book. 
the need. The need is standing, the need is seeing, the need is walking and asking for the Word of God and living according to its path and its principles. But I want you to go back to Jeremiah chapter number 6. And in Jeremiah chapter number 6, stand ye in the ways God is saying this. Which by the way, if God's saying get to the old past, I believe it means something. And see and ask for the old pass, wherein is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Notice what he says. Ye shall find what, church? Have you ever been in a place where you did not have rest in your soul? Where there was a constant battle within? Can I tell you? There's rest for your souls when you get right in the Word of God. I want to show you how this corresponds with each other. The word of the Lord in Jesus Christ. Go to the book of John chapter 1. Hold in your place in Jeremiah chapter number 6. The book of John chapter number 1. Now as you're turning to the gospel of John, what you're going to notice is another name for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now during the Christmas season, we often think about different names of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We think about the book of Isaiah that says, His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And then in Matthew chapter 1, His name shall be called Jesus, for He shall save His people from their sin. And then His name shall be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Well here we are in the book of John. Chapter number 1, verse number 1. In the beginning was the... Who's the Word? Jesus Christ is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If you recall the book of Genesis, God said, Let us make man in our own image, after our own image. And He made them male and female, created He them. According to the word of the Lord, Jesus and the Spirit of God was there at the creation story. In the beginning was the word. And that's not just Old Testament, that's New Testament. Jesus being the word was with God. And notice this, the Jehovah's Witness isn't going to like verse number 1. Their Bible is going to tamper with verse number 1. Because the word of God says here, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word, what church? Oh, you mean Jesus and God are the same? That's exactly what the Bible preaches over and over and over again. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him and without Him was not anything made that was made. Jesus had to be there. In Him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. He was not this light, verse 8, but was sent to bear witness of the light. That Jesus was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh in into the world. In verse number 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and the truth. And there wrapped up in the lowly Bethlehem manger stall, the Lord Jesus came incarnate, wrapped in flesh, that we may know Him and the power of His resurrection. And therefore, verse number 12 says, but as many as received Him to to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. A supernatural work that Jesus said in John chapter number 3, except a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of heaven. And we come to understand that Jesus Christ is the way. Jesus Christ is the word. Jesus Christ is the only begotten of the Father. Jesus Christ is that which was prophesied about in the book of Isaiah chapter 55 that he would come to die that we might live. Jesus is the word of life. Now go to Matthew chapter number 11. Matthew chapter number 11. We're still thinking about the fact that when you walk and stand and see and ask for the old paths, wherein is the good way, you'll find rest. I think it's interesting how awesome it is to be able to move from the Old Testament to the New Testament and still find out that God wants us to always get back to one thing, and that is the Word of the Lord. Look at what it says about the Word of the Lord. 
in verse number 28 of chapter 11 of the book of Matthew. Come unto me. It was mentioned in Sunday school this morning. All ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you what church? We're laboring and we're heavy laden because we're trying to do it ourselves. We're trying to work our own way to heaven. We're trying to allow our life of sin to ease our pain. When in all reality, sin will only satisfy for a season. But the Savior satisfies for all time. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I, Jesus, am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find what church? Rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 6. We see the neglect, the neglecting of the fear of God, the neglecting of the personal holiness of God, the neglecting of the word of the Lord. Then we saw the need. The need was to stand, to see, to ask, to walk in the old past. And the need is to find rest for your souls. Oh, don't you realize that when you're in the way of sin, don't you realize that in, when you're in the way of compromise, don't you realize that when you neglect a proper fear of God and personal holiness, that you are in a hard place and the way of the transgressor, the way of the rebeller, the way of the one who is against God is always going to be hard. What do you need? Rest for your souls. I want to show you the nonsense. God said I'll give you rest if you stand, see, ask, walk in my ways. But notice what they say in Jeremiah chapter number 6. They look right back at God and God's man. At the end of verse number 16, but they said, we will, what's that word? Are you serious, Israel? We will not walk therein. Now we'll take our finger and we'll point it at Israel and we'll say what I just said. Are you serious, Israel? After all that God has done for you, you're not going to walk in God's way. You're not going to walk in the old paths. You're not going to walk in the word of the Lord. You're not going to walk in this grace of God. After all of that, but I believe we could take the finger and let it point back right at our own lives and say, Come on, preacher. What are you doing? This is a bunch of nonsense what you're doing. The direction you're going, the way you're living, the things that you are doing. It doesn't make sense to not walk in the way of God when he has done so much for you. It's easy to point our fingers at others or people groups or things that are done. But what about your own life? They said together they were unified in their decision this morning. We talked about a different type of unity and decision. Here they are unified in their decision to go against God. They said we will not walk therein. Then look at what it says in verse 17. I also, or also I set watchmen over you saying, hearken unto the sound of the trumpet. So here's what they would do. Oh, the prophet's so burdened with this. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet and therefore the book of lamentation is written. And Jeremiah says, I'm preaching and pouring my heart out and they're not turning. They just rejected my word. Okay, I need another preacher. Hey, come here, preacher. This is what he would do. He would say, oh man, these people aren't listening to me. I'm going to set you over here and I'm going to let you stand and preach to them. And then he would go over hear and he said man that's not enough and he'd get up another preacher and he'd pick him up and he said hey I want you to be a watchman over these people and he would do that over and over and over again and these watchmen would preach the word of God return but look at what they say thank you guys for willfully volunteering no Even though all those watchmen were being used, look at what they did. Verse 17. They said, we will not hearken. You say, preacher, we need more churches. We need more gospel preachers. We need more men of God who are called to preach. We need more missionaries. And I would agree with that. But you know what we need more than that? Is a return to the old past, which you know to be the word of the Lord, a returning back to his way. That's what we need. Let me ask you a question. Where do you find yourself in this passage? 
It's often important to be truthful with yourself. I hope you're not neglecting. I hope you find yourself in the middle of our message. Enjoying the need. Being one that stands. Being one that sees. Being one that asks for. And certainly we could preach a whole message on verse 16. Well, certainly you're enjoying walking in the word of God. Because as you walk in the word of God. You're walking in the light. And you're not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. And you're not walking in the way of darkness. And therefore you are under the spout where the glory comes out. Hopefully you're there. Hopefully you're enjoying the rest of the Lord. Everything's alright in my father's house. Where there's joy, joy, joy. Because I am in verse 16. But I hope you're not at the last part of verse 16 or the last part of verse 17 where there is a willful neglecting of the word of God we will not hearken. How many times do you need to hear what is right before you do what is right? Listen church, we live in a day where a new statistic came out that said by the age of 11 93% of teenagers have viewed pornography. Certainly you understand the destruction that comes from that and the lifestyle that that pushes and promotes to go completely against the will and the word and the way of God. And if 93% of our young people are so infected and impacted by such a sin as that, it's making your homework even harder. And I'm not saying your homework like you get from school, but the work that the parents have at home to do is getting tougher and tougher in 2015 as we carry on into 2016 because we have a community and a congregation and a world that's getting deeper and deeper in a neglect of the fear of God. A neglect of personal holiness. A neglect of the word of the Lord. You got a lot of homework to do. Again, I'm not talking about algebra. I'm talking about taking out the pickaxe for your own heart first and breaking up the fallow ground. I'm talking about doing the work that God has called you to do as a man and manning up and saying, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We're not going to live in sin. We're not going to walk in darkness. We're going to walk in the word of God. We're going to be a family that as best as I can have it, we're going to have the rest of the Lord here. Do you want your house to be an oasis? For the things of God, where there's a sigh of relief. Or do you want your house to be in obscure darkness? That the longer you go in life, the deeper and deeper the sin paths go. Don't let your house be that way. Let your house be a way of God. Have a part in your house living for the light of the Lord. Be influential in the word of God. Having the prominence in your household. The Lord Jesus Christ being exalted. Oh what a perfect time of the year it is. To exalt Jesus Christ in your home. But will you? I'm simply calling. As a revival would. And I hope it did. Just simply to get back to this. And if what it says. To do. I'll do. And if it what it says to not do, I won't do. The word of the Lord, it's powerful. It's quick. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And I'll close with this poem. Generation follows generation. Yet it lives. Nations rise and nations fall. Yet it lives. Kings, dictators, presidents, well, they come and go, yet it lives. Hated, despised, and cursed, yet it lives. Scoffed at by scorners, yet it lives. Condemned by atheists, yet it lives. Exaggerated by fanatics, yet it lives. Misconstructed and misstated, yet it lives. Ranted and raved about, yet it lives. It's inspiration denied, yet it lives. Yet it lives as a lamp unto our feet. Yet it lives as a light unto our path. Yet it lives as the gate to heaven. Yet it lives as the standard for childhood. Yet it lives as a guide for the youth. 
Yet it lives as the inspiration for the matured. Yet it lives as comfort for the aged. Yet it lives as food for the hungry. Yet it lives as water for the thirsty. Yet it lives as rest for the weary. Yet it lives as light for the heathen. Yet it lives as salvation for the sinner. Yet it lives as grace for the Christian. To know it is to love it. To love it is to accept it. And to accept it means a life that pleases God. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven, regardless of whether we believe it or not. Great peace of they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. If I meditate in these book, this book day and night, I shall have great success. Oh, thy words are sweet unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey unto my mouth. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting. Oh, how we need to get back to this book. that's nothing I can force you to do let's pray our Lord and Heavenly Father I come before you and I stress the importance before your people of getting back to the word of God first and foremost in the house of God it's time for judgment to begin right here and I pray Lord that we would not put ourselves in the side of bondage but in the side of freedom that we would truly walk in the liberty of Christ that we would enjoy the rest that you give. But from your word I understand that because of Jesus Christ. This Christianity thing isn't to be a hard laborious thing. It is to be the easy yoke of Christ. Where there's rest for my soul. So Lord I pray that you would reveal the confusion for as it is. That which is fleshly and that which is from the devil. For we know that you are not the author of confusion but of peace as unto all the churches of the saints. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And help us to come right back to you, that we may find rest for our souls. I pray that we would come before you tonight, acknowledging our sin, saying we're sorry, confessing it before you. I pray that we would clear the slate, that before you we would truly have peace, and not just a temporary peace that lies to ourselves. Bring us back to where we need to be. In Jesus' name.